1 Peter chapter 4, we will be looking at verses 8 through 11. The gifts of the Spirit should be exercised within the church. What are the gifts of the Spirit? When you look at the book of Romans chapter 12, he gives you a list of various gifts. Look at Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14, and he gives you a Several other lists of the gifts of the Spirit. Of the Spirit meaning that it, they are gifts of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, that He gives to you. And more than likely, they are gifts that you're not even aware of that you have. They are not gifts that you earned or that you were educated in. They're not gifts that you think you have, but more than likely, they are gifts that... that make you uncomfortable, that stretch you, that make you do things that you normally don't do. And the purpose behind that is is that God receives the glory because normally you wouldn't be doing those type of things. Peter will be talking about that this morning. We left off last week in verse 7. We talked about the end of all things at hand and that we are to be serious and watchful and in prayer. And as we look at the world around us today, we know that uh, these are signs, these are events that are taking place, telling us, revealing to us as believers that the end of all things is at hand. It's getting closer and closer. I see it. It's so clear. And I want to be busy doing the work of my father, as Jesus said, when he was found in the temple. And his mother said, where have you been? He says, doing the work of my father. It's the purpose that he sent me here. And so I want to be busy, and being busy means that we need to be serious We need to be watchful, and we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer. Today, Peter will instruct us on these various gifts and how we need to use these gifts even in times of persecution. In times of suffering, God is still working. Let me encourage you. Things are happening in the world today. Things are happening in your life. Some of you are financially stretched. Others of you have struggles with your relationships. God is still working. And within those struggles, within those persecutions, within those strifes, God is working things out for good. And you have to see that. And so there are requirements for us to continue to serve God, serve one another, even while we're being persecuted. Serving one another. You'll notice in these few verses that Peter uses the word one another, one another, one another, three times, speaking about believers in Christ Jesus. In his whole epistle, he uses those words seven times. And so how important it is that we as believers care about one another. It's very important to God. We are an example to the world that God exists. It is by Our love for one another that men know that Christ exists because only God can put that love in a man's heart to love another man. And so Peter will talk about love, talk about hospitality, talk about serving. And these are simple things that we should be doing as believers. They're not difficult. In fact, as we go through them, we probably don't really need to expound too much on it because they are simple things. We know that we're to love. We know that we're to be hospitable people. We know that we're to minister to one another. We know that we have gifts and we should use them. And it's oftentimes the simple things that we struggle with, isn't it? Just those simple things of loving one another. It's so difficult for us to do. And the only way that we can do those things is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's get into today's text and let's look at the first uh, instruction here to love one another. Verse 8, above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Very simple. Peter says, in light of your suffering and your persecutions, remember to love one another. And remember that when you love one another, there will be times when you need to ignore or cover or allow God to work in that individual's heart when it comes to sin. You need to overlook that and let love cover it 
knowing that God is in total control. He says, above all things, above all things. In fact, the Greek says that it's before all things. So before anything else, we are to fervently love one another. What's the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said, to love the Lord thy God. The second is like it, we are to love one another. It's the second commandment. Jesus even said that if we fulfill those two commandments, we fulfill the whole law. How simple and yet so difficult for us to do. The word fervent here, Peter is emphasizing the fact that this love needs to be fervent love. In the Greek, it literally means to stretch out. It's an intense strain to love someone. How many feel like sometimes uh, loving someone is a strain? (laughs) Yeah, it's a strain. But God calls us to love that person through Jesus Christ. And of course, the word love there is agape, unconditional love. They don't deserve it, but you give it. They didn't earn it, but you still give it. It's an unconditional love that loves the individual uh, above the, even the sin that they may be involved in because love covers a multitude of sin. And Peter quotes the Old Testament. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, Solomon said, Hatred stirs up strife. But love covers all sin. When you look to the cross, what did Jesus do? He covered all sin by his death on the cross, by his blood that was shed for our sins. He covered it. He took care of it all completely, past, present, and future sins. Let me say it in the Amplified Translation. It says, above all things... Have intense and unfailing love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sin. Now an example of that. Because it is difficult to love people when there's strife within the relationship. Very difficult. It's difficult to love your enemies. And yet Jesus said, love your enemies. And so it separates us from the world as believers. And if you are a believer in Christ Jesus and you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you pretty much have asked him to come into your life and to change your life. You've asked him to get rid of your old life and to give you a new life, actually. You've promised, you've made a commitment to follow after him, to be obedient to him. Not in a religious way, but in a relationship. And so our desire is to love one another, even in spite of the strife that we might have with one another. In Genesis chapter 13 and 14, we have a situation where Abraham will deliver his nephew Lot. Abraham had taken his nephew Lot out of the land of Chaldeans, the land of Ur, and he brought Lot with him to the promised land, in a sense, the land that God was going to give to Abraham and multiply his seed. Well, as they were growing, Lot and his men began to have strife with Abraham and his men. You know what strife is, right? They started to argue. Wait a minute. That's mine. That's not yours. This is my side. This is your side. Stay off of my side. You stay on your side. You know, that's strife. I don't like the way you're doing that. We do it differently. And so get out of here. Let's do it my way. That's strife. You know, whatever the strife could be, there was at strife. And so Abraham saw this, and being the wiser and older, he told his nephew Lot, you choose, where do you want to go? Because this strife can't continue. We have to separate. He loved him, and he gave him the choice. Lot decided to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where Lot was found, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, we know that God's judgment came upon Sodom and Gomorrah later on because it was a wicked city. Now, while Lot was there, some kings in the nearby area there decided that they were going to come and attack Sodom and Gomorrah and take all of their wealth. And so as they went into Sodom and Gomorrah and they destroyed the kings and, and, and took all of their wealth and then took some of their people, Lot was also taken into captivity. Abraham hears about this, and as he hears about this, he tells his men, aha, that's what Lot deserves. Is that what he said? No. You could say that, though, couldn't you, with some people? How many times have you said that? Oh, they deserve that. Or maybe you didn't say it, but you thought it like, you know, know, they sow what they reap. You even use scripture, right? (laughs) No, Abraham didn't do that, though. He got his choice men, and he went after the kings. 
And he conquered them and took everything back along with his nephew Lot. See, that's an example of love, even in the midst of strife. That's how we ought to be as believers in Christ Jesus. By this they will know you're my disciples. By the, by the love that you have one for another. By the love you have one for another. As difficult as that is, Christians need to love one another and be united in heart. United in heart. As Peter is speaking here, he's calling for a love that is intense and fervent. How do you receive a love like that? This is the kind of love that requires a Christian to put others ahead of their own desires. It requires you to think more highly of others than you think of yourself. In spite of the way that you're being treated, in spite of the fact that people are unkind, ungracious, or even hostile to you. It's not hard. It's difficult to do. It's not hard to say, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. It's difficult to say, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be generous, I'm going to be loving, I'm going to be caring. Only God can do a work like that. This is the kind of love that blinds itself from the sins of others. Such a love is not a love that publicizes the other's sins, doesn't speak about the other ill, but actually protects that individual. That's the true love that Peter is talking about, that agape love that covers a multitude of sins. We have a, another example of that in the Old Testament with Noah. You remember Noah, the flood? And after the flood, Noah found land. And Noah, the Bible says, got drunk. And as he was drunk, he took his clothes off and he was naked, which brought shame to him. His son walks in and sees his nakedness. Now that's like the individual who sees someone's nakedness or sees someone's sin and then goes and tells someone else. Oh, guess what this person did? Guess what that person did? And they're on the phone and they're texting all the time about other people. And that's how his son was. So his son goes and tells the other brothers. Well, the other brother said, that's not right. So they went in to cover their father's nakedness. They took some cloth and they walked him backwards that they would not see his nakedness and they covered him that's what peter's talking about covering the sins of others now this was their father and of course as sons you should cover the nakedness of your own father now don't misunderstand me i'm not saying that we are to tolerate sin or excuse it or justify it no sin is sin and god will deal with it god will deal with it and we need to reveal it in someone's heart if it's there and then help them to get out of that sin. Encourage them to get right with God. Train them, if need be, to not sin any longer. So we're to love one another. Also, we are to be hospitable to one another. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And that's the underlying word, without grumbling. How do you do that? Some don't have that gift of hospitality. They don't like to invite people over to their house. And so when people come over, they're grumbling. I like what Chuck Smith said. There are some people that know how to make you feel at home, and then there are some people that make you feel like you want to go home. You know? It's usually those people that are just comfortable with their house and with who they are that they invite you in. You know, they say that there's a threefold hospitality. One is that you have hospitality to your family. It's different than with others, isn't it? My family comes over, and my grandkids will jump on my couch and lay on my couch and move the pillows all over the place. In fact, they will tell you, this is my house. You know, and I remind them, no, it's not your house. I pay the bills here. I pay the mortgage. You know, you are at my house. Okay, I know all that, but it's my house, you know, and they'll argue with me. But they feel comfortable, and so you're, you're hospitable to them because they're your family. But then there are those out of necessity. There are those that, out of being strangers or courtesy or to the poor or those who, who need charity, where you open up your house because there's a need there. There's a need to meet, and so you're willing to meet that need. You'll be surprised at how much Scripture talks about 
hospitality. Uh, the Bible tells us in Genesis 18 that, that Abraham, again, Abraham entertained angels. Uh, Paul urges believers uh, to follow after hospitality. 1 Timothy 5.10 tells us to remember Abraham's example of hospitality. And then Hebrews 13.2 tells us do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. So hospitality was something that believers did at this time. Oftentimes when you had evangelists going door to door, the Christians would house them because of the hospitality and as they were spreading the gospel message around or housing even strangers themselves. But yet, it's still difficult to open up your house to stranger. It's something that only God can do in your heart. I remember we were out witnessing at the bus station here in downtown Riverside, and there was a gal there that we were sharing with, and she was going to a home, a rehab home. She had been on drugs, and she was trying to kick it and get her life straight, but she missed her bus. She was, she was going to have to stay on the streets. And so I opened up our house, and I said, you can come and stay with us for the night, and we'll bring you back to the bus station. That's hospitality. Now, I was careful because I know that bringing people into your home can be dangerous too. So I asked her to, to dump all of her purse and whatever belongings she had, and she dumped them out, and we saw that she didn't have any weapons, and we were able to sleep without any problems. And, and every time we did that, we slept without any problems. We weren't concerned at all. We did it several times. And that's entertaining strangers, entertaining strangers because we know there was a need there. So again, Peter instructs us to love and to entertain others. Then he instructs us to serve one another. Look at verse 10. Now he starts this statement off with, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Now let's stop and look at the phrase, as each one has received a gift. Now, the picture there of is that believers receiving a gift. Well, what kind of gift is it? The Greek word here is charisma, and it literally means grace, or literally meaning to give a gift of grace. So this gift is a gift of grace. You don't earn it, nor do you deserve it, but God gives you a gift of grace. And what Peter is saying here is that it's God who gives you the gifts that you have. It's God that gives them to you. And that's why I said earlier, these are gifts that you don't earn. These are gifts that you can't stir up. You might even think, well, I have the gift of this. That might not be true. Yeah, you're able and are gifted in that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that God gave you that gift. Oftentimes, the gift that God gives you is a difficult gift. You're thinking, why did you give me that gift? I normally don't do this. You know, it's not something that I'm comfortable with. And, and so I really don't like it. But yet God is using you with that gift. And so he gets the glory for using you. I will oftentimes tell people from the pulpit periodically that I'm not comfortable teaching the word of God. There's a great responsibility there. I will be accountable, especially as a teacher. I've never been a person to stand behind a pulpit, let alone within a crowd, and just speak. That's not me. I'm very shy. I usually will hang around people and be quiet and listen more than anything else. Just went to a, a, a pastor's meeting, and everyone's talking and back and forth, and I'm listening. I didn't open up my mouth. You know, like Chuck says, it, you know, if you want people to think you're a fool, just open up your mouth and it will remove all doubt. <laughs> and so I just like better to keep my mouth shut than all of a sudden they go, wait a minute, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? That's just me. And so teaching behind a pulpit is difficult for me. It is strange and it's hard. And I never saw myself doing it. In fact, there are times where I literally, my head, my head sweats. Because I'm like, what am I doing up here, you know? And it's like, I'm sweaty. But you can't tell. And people can't tell. And they think, wow, he's so comfortable up there. And so That's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift of God given to me. And so he receives the glory because of it. God gives me that gift. And then I am faithful to use that gift. It's a gift of grace. Can't be earned. Can't even be pursued. But, or worked for. It can only be received. It can only be received. So, you can't love people. I can't love people. There are people I don't love. I don't like. 
I don't want to see. But God gives me a love for them. And it's a love that he gives me through the Holy Spirit. I don't want to open up my house to people. I don't want people coming over to my house and looking through my cabinets, you know, because they're in my house. And it's uncomfortable to think that people are in my house. And yet he opens up our house all the time. We have a baptism and everyone's in and out. You know, I remember when we first started doing that, it was a struggle because things were being broken. It happens. Things get broken. Doors get broken. Locks get broken. You know, uh, things that normally are used in certain ways. Kids have a way of finding out how to use them in different ways. You know, gates that they stand on, just all kinds of stuff like that. And after the parties, we go through and we think, okay, we got to repair this, repair that. Oh, we got to replace that and so forth. And at first it was a struggle. It was like, why do we do this? <laughs> you know, we buy these things and they're valuable to us, but then people just destroy them. You know, but it is a gift of hospitality. And eventually God removes that and says, it's not about the things you have. It's about the people that get to come in and be blessed by the Spirit of God. And so it's not an issue anymore. It's not an issue anymore. It's only something that the Spirit of God can give us and control in us. So he says, minister it to one another. We're to use these gifts for one another. That is the body of Christ. You all have gifts. God has given you those gifts, and you're to use them within the body of Christ for one another. And if you're not using them, then you're neglecting the gifts that God has given to you. And you're neglecting the body of Christ. If you're not loving, if you're not hospitable, then you're neglecting the gift that God has given to you. As good stewards, he says, of the manifold grace of God. Now, what he's saying here is is that you need to be faithful. You need to use those gifts. As good stewards, stewards are me- member are not people that own things. They don't have their own wealth. They are entrusted with other things. So stewards are using the master's wealth, the master's resources, and they are being faithful with it. That's the key to the gifts that we have. That's the key to uh, being entrusted with the things of God. Some of you are involved with ministry here, with ministry in various ministries, from the children's ministry to the ushers to greeters. There's a responsibility that that you fulfill those ministries, that you are faithful to that ministry. We're having a ministry meeting. It's a requirement that you come to this ministry meeting for encouragement, for equipment, for strength, to see what's going on with the other ministry meetings. It's a requirement. Uh, It's required that you're here once a week in church. That's a requirement for being in ministry so that you're equipped, you're refreshed, you see the direction that God is moving. And if you're not, then you're not being a faithful steward of what God has entrusted to you. And we want to be faithful stewards of the manifold grace of God. Manifold means of various kinds of gifts. And by the way, there are various kinds. We don't all have the same gift. Don't get upset when someone doesn't understand your gift. Because only you can understand the gift that you have. Someone else can't. You might have the gift of, you know, compassion. And we should all have that gift to a certain degree. But there are some people that just have this compassion. And it's a gift that God has given to them. And it's just uh, over and beyond. And that person that's compassionate can't understand why everyone else is not compassionate like they're compassionate. And so they get uncompassionate at others. You know, and so it kind of works in the negative for them. You need to be careful. You need to be careful. God has given you the gift to be faithful with, not others. Okay? So because your ministry isn't growing, because your ministry isn't doing this or doing that, because others aren't involved, it has nothing to do with others. God is working in you. He's getting your focus off of others and putting it on Him. God will bring to you like-minded people. He will bring to you people that have the same gifts and that will help you in those ministries in time when you realize that it is a gift of the Holy Spirit and He's given it to you and He's given it to others and you just have to wait for others to come alongside. If others are are forcing, if they're forcing themselves to do those gifts, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. I I see it all the time where people are excited and and they want to fill in and and do stuff and then just kind of after a while it's like, ah... It, they don't want to do it anymore. It's not fulfilling. It's not something that they see themselves doing for a long time, and so they fade out. 
And that's when you know it wasn't a gift of God. It was more a gift of their flesh because they wanted to, whatever reason. And so you have to be careful. Now, I'm not saying that you can't help and get involved and see where God is leading you. I think that's a good way of doing that. See where God is leading you and what gifts you may have and then get involved that way. But to force it, that's the struggle. That's the struggle of the manifold grace of God. Now, he gives us the gifts of love, hospitality, of ministering one to another, and we're going to see one of teaching. Uh, That's grace. That's grace. Grace means that he enables you to fulfill that gift. Even in dying, there are many being martyred today in our world. Uh, In some countries, um, I just saw a post where children were beheaded by Muslims because of their Christian faith. This is happening right now. And here we are in America, you know, crying sometimes because we don't have certain material things. And these kids are dying for their faith. And that's a type of grace that God has given to them, that they're able to die with honor, with glorifying God in their last words. There's a story and an illustration of this uh, by Thomas Hucker, who died in England in 1555. He was going to be burned at the stake. And just to tell a long story short, as he was getting ready to be burnt, his friend came to him and says, "Um, could you do me a favor? Because I need to know. I need to know how powerful God's grace is. And so could you let us know if you still have peace and if you're still at rest with God while they're burning you? Could you just raise your hands and just let us know right before you die? that you're okay. And so he says, yes, I will. So as they began to burn him at the stake, his hair literally was gone. His features were being destroyed. His fingers were burnt off completely. And he was just hanging there still. And they thought that he was dead. And all of a sudden, he raised up his hands and he clapped three times to let them know that God's grace is sufficient that God gave him the peace, God gave him the strength to go through that for his glory. And the crowd began to just praise and applaud the Lord because of that. See, that's God's grace, efficiency. He enables you, he strengthens you to do all those things when we seek him and ask for those things. Why? For his glory. Look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. Now, here's another gift. Speaking, instructing others is a gift of God. It's not your gift. It's not your ability. It's not your sufficiency. It is God's. As I said earlier, others saw the gift in me before I saw it. I remember my wife would tell me, I see you teaching as a pastor in a church, and I look at her like, you're crazy. I'm like, there's no way I would be teaching in a church as a pastor. There's just no way. I never saw myself doing that. And this was years before I even had the opportunity she saw me doing that. And I just thought that she was totally nuts. And then people would come up to me and would thank me for the knowledge and thank me for the instructions and various things like this. I still wouldn't believe it. You know? And then God finally had to put me through things and put me in a situation where either I had to deny it or I had to accept it, that this is what God had for me. And so I accepted it. I don't like it at times, you know, because I will step down from this pulpit and I will go, what a knucklehead I was today. I couldn't pronounce that word. I messed that line up. I didn't do this right. Oh, boy, it's like it doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm like, God, how can you even, even use something like that? And I walk away some, probably almost every Sunday going, what am I doing up there, Lord? And then someone will come along and say, thanks, Pastor, that was a great message. Even after this, the, the first service today, it's like, you know, you could apply this to even relationships in our marriages. I'm like, I never even went that way, but the Spirit ministered to them that way. See, that's nothing to do with me. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, it's all you, not me. And so I continue to be faithful and mess up and say the wrong things. And and God still ministers. 
because it's a gift of grace. It's his sufficiency. And so Peter here is saying, look, these are the oracles of God, the revelation of God. You are to be faithful as a speaker to speak what God says. Too many speakers are speaking their own words. They're doing their own thing. They're standing behind the pulpits and they're t- giving story after story after story, but they're not teaching you the word of God. I am glad that I am not a speaker by natural means. You know, just some people have that ability. You know, you, you listen to them and they, they got the gift. We call it the gift of gab. My granddaughters all have the gift of gab. I don't have to say a word. They all talk to me all day long. Whatever on any subject, and it changes from here to there, and I just like uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, you know, and they just love talking. I don't have that gift, you know, and so I'm very limited. And so I love the fact that I don't have to have it, I just have to stick with the text and just read it, expound on it, and leave the rest up to the Lord because I can't tell story after story after story. I'm not that way, you know, I'm not that way. You know, there are preachers that actually hire people to write their sermons out. And so they pay for them, then they study them, and then they give them as though it's their own. See, that's not a gift. That's a career, and that's manipulation. There are people that that really will hire professional musicians to come out to church because it draws a crowd in. People like hearing music, and they like that latest band. So let's go here over there because it's free, and we get to hear it. And so a lot of churches will... Use the big name bands because they're drawing people in. Chuck Smith has always taught, if you use carnal means to reach carnal people, you'll have a carnal church. Now, carnal means a fleshly church. They're doing everything in the flesh. It's a gimmick. It's a ploy. It's rewards for people being there instead of it being spiritual. So if you're going to use worldly means to reach worldly people, you're going to have a worldly church, and you'll be struggling all the time. But if you use spiritual things, if you teach people just the Word of God, and if they're willing to sit there and listen to it like you all are, Sunday after Sunday, then I know you're spiritual because you listen to the Word, and you're not listening to the fact that I can't say this word, or I'm not telling this story or that story. You're actually just listening for God to minister to you. And there are some that come in here that don't like the way that I speak because it's not good enough. You know, and so they're looking for someone that's polished. They're looking for someone that, that, that really commands the English language and it's a great orator. You know, and they'll find them because they're all out there. They're all out there. But when you find someone that's sincere and just sharing the word of God, then you have something. And when you share as pastors and as teachers, we need to share the word of God. We are extensions of God's arms, in a sense. We're not to share our own thoughts. We're not to share even about us, because it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross for us. I remember I'd gone to a, um, a class on the gifts of the Spirit in Costa Mesa, and I really appreciated this instructor instructor because the first thing he said was i want to explain something to you pastor chuck would love to be here right now but the church is huge at that time like twelve thousand people and so he can't be here so i am an extension of pastor chuck you will hear what chuck believes you will hear from me as though you heard from chuck i'm not going to tell you what i believe i'm not going to tell you what i think it should be i'm going to tell you what chuck would say if he was standing right here and i thought wow that's humility that's understanding of scripture and that's understanding of his leadership and his love for his leadership that he wouldn't do anything but be that example of them and that's what he did because i've heard chuck's messages on the gifts of the spirit and he basically just said the same thing again and and applied it to us we as teachers whether children's ministry, whether in the church or even outside in public, if you do it outside or you're sharing with people, we are responsible with what we share. And we should be sharing the word of God. These are the oracles, the revelation of God. And so if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Important, underline that. The ability which God supplies, because that's what I have been saying is that you can't do it in your own strength. It has to be with the ability of God. 
If you think that you can prepare yourself for it, you can't. If you think you have to wait until a certain age or a certain maturity comes, you know, I think that you're misguided because it has to be God's ability and which he supplies to you. There are great teachers. Pastor Chuck's, I don't know of a greater teacher than Pastor Chuck. The guy is so knowledgeable and yet he keeps it so simple that we all understand it. If you've never heard him outside of the pulpit, outside of the church, just speaking, I mean, he can get so deep that it just goes over your head. But yet he's so great at it that he's able to just give it to you so that you can eat right from his hands. He's just amazing, amazing. And, and that's the grace that God has had in his life. And he would say that's how Calvary has been established and grown because of God's beautiful grace. Because I'm sure he would say that he has no ability for it either. And so it's God's ability that he supplies to us so that we can fulfill those things. The only thing that we need to do is have faith, obedience, and surrender our own rights. See, I had to surrender my right and say, Lord, I don't like being in this position. I don't want to be in this position. My head sweats too many times. But I surrender myself, and I just trust in you that you'll take control. I don't want to love this person. I hate this person. He's an enemy. But I will submit to you and allow you to take control of my life, and I will reflect Jesus Christ. Again, I will be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Why? That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose, that God may be glorified. And I was sitting in a meeting not too long ago, and the whole meeting was around how we teach the Word of God. These were pastors, senior pastors, and they were all about how you teach the Word of God, um, how you present it? Do you have repetitive statements? Um, do you whittle it down? Do you, um, you know, perfect it? And so I sat in this meeting, and again, I, didn't, I, didn't, I did not say a word. I just kind of uh, let the Spirit of God move and listen and so forth. And it was all great and wonderful, because as pastors, we want to better ourselves. We want to study harder. We want to understand and read more and so forth. But the thing that I think was missing in it all, and, and I don't think it was on purpose. I think it was just an accident because we were just trying to look at how we could be better at what we do, was, was the sense of relying on the Holy Spirit. Because you look out there in the teaching world of Christianity, and you have a variety of teachers, Right? variety of teachers and you get some teachers that are not well spoken but yet the holy spirit has a hold of them and people are saved all the time and you can't neglect that or discount that because that's the holy spirit moving and then you read something in acts chapter 4 verse 13 and it says when they saw the boldness of peter and john and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men they marveled and realize they'd been with Jesus. God literally called uneducated, untrained men. So much so that people saw that, but yet the word of God was going out, and they were marveling at it. Now you might say, yeah, but the apostle Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament. That's the guy that God used. Wait a minute. Paul himself said, I don't use excellency of words. Apollo is more polished than I am. So Paul struggled with, with, with his teaching and preaching also. What did God use? God used the willingness to say that it's not my gift, it is God's gift, and it's his ability and his sufficiency. And I just put my faith and trust in him if anything good can come out of this mouth. And that goes for any gift that we have. And then Peter ends by saying, if God receives the glory and honor, it's because all glory belongs to him. Dominion, which means power, rule, supreme authority, 
forever and ever. Amen. That's a doxology. He, he kind of gets excited about the fact that he's teaching about these gifts that we all have and we should use them and, and that God should receive the glory because he uses riches like us. And so glory belongs to him. And he almost ends his whole message, and yet he still has uh, another chapter to go. And he says, Amen. Let it be fulfilled, as he read to these believers and encouraging them while they're suffering. It all belongs to God, so we can't receive the glory. Let Jesus receive the glory. Let me close. The only limit to God's grace is the limit that we put on him. God may be stretching you. God may be challenging you. And he's trying to tell you it's not about you. And he's not waiting for you to get right. He's not waiting for you to get equipped. He's not waiting for you to be mature. He's waiting for you to surrender to him. And then he does all that. Equip, mature, and all those things. God has given you a gift to use And so we're to use it for the glory of God, for one another, for one another. There's even a lot lacking in this church. So many gifts that need to be used in this body here. So many gifts that are being used. We have the gift of service here. The servants here are wonderful. After the ladies' brunch yesterday, guys came afterwards, and we set everything back up. We cleaned everything. You know, that's the gift of serving. That's the gift of love for the body of Christ. Those are the type of gifts that we need. I know it gets difficult at times to serve because we get tired and we're always serving, but what's so wonderful is to see the same guys doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, and you know it's a gift of God, and it's God's grace and sufficiency. I'm not saying that if you get tired that you shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is that you need to surrender to God, surrender yourself to Him, and know that you're serving Him in that ability whether it's serving here to help prepare the grounds or whether it's in the children's ministry or any other ministry, you're serving Him and for His glory. And so do it to the best of your ability.